Welcome back to the wardrobe. And a chat with another broadcasting legend, Johnny Gold. You've probably seen him on Sky News um, or heard him on loads of different radio stations, networked on different radio stations, uh, does a lot of sport broadcasting. Great guy. Uh, and a bloke who was caught up in quite a large scandal. If you remember the President's Club incident, uh, a black tie dinner where waitresses were supposed to have been groped and abused and he had nothing to do with it nothing at all but he was roped in on that and so I talked to him about that I talked to him about his philosophy on broadcasting he's got some he's got some pretty um, straight talking views on the current state of broadcasting in this country and uh, and also on the the story about bias at the BBC he doesn't hold back. He's a he's an honest guy. He's a communicator. He's a good guy, and he's got a fabulous podcast. It's called Johnny Gould's Jewish State. It's not an overtly Jewish podcast. I mean, a lot of the guests are not Jewish. It's a great podcast. He's a good guy. It's lovely to talk to him. This is Johnny Gould. So, Johnny Gould, the podcast is called Johnny Gould's Jewish State. What's the idea behind it? Well, uh, despite the title, it's not a campaign. Uh, it's actually a play on words. It's about the condition of myself, the state of me, um, which means that I examine great interviewees. And, of course, they're not Jewish. It's not a qualification. They're from all walks of life. So it's really about kind of universal values. And the guests we've had so far in episodes one to 20, which I'm delighted were part of the inaugural lineup of podcast radio when it was just in London, featured giants like Colonel Richard Kemp, uh, Baroness Ruth Deitch, the amazing Trevor Horn, uh, the uh, million selling record producer, who was confirmed uh, in the Church of England in Durham Cathedral, but has gone to synagogue for 32 years. So you can see there's a sort of theme about this. Colonel Richard Kemp, a former um, commander of forces in uh, Afghanistan, um, is an unconditional and wavering supporter of Israel. So I asked him about that. I asked him about the geopolitical parts of, of the world where he thought the threat to our military was, about our support for America, um, and indeed about Iran. So that was in uh, series one, and we've got some amazing ones coming up. Now that podcast radio is national, I'm going to bring some even more big guns to uh, to your output, Graham. So absolutely delighted to be part of it. And which guest have you personally learned the most from? Do you know what? I say to each of my guests afterwards, and it's genuinely true, that incrementally each one of them changes my view, that they are great educators. I think the one that has had the biggest impact on me is a guy called Danny. And now I don't know his full name because that was the condition by which I could interview him. He'd never done an interview before in English. He was the Mossad commander. I believe his real name is Danny, but it's in inverted commas. I don't know what his name is. He's never done an interview before. He did one on iPhone on YouTube in Spanish, which is his sort of native language. But he was the Mossad commander who masterminded uh, the emancipation of tens of thousands of Ethiopian Jews from Sudanese refugee camps using all means, um, passports carried through official routes, uh, giant boats, which he sailed down the Suez Canal, massive Boeing cargo planes, undercover with other Mossad commanders for, from a hotel, from a diving school. Um, it was actually run as a diving school. But the miracle of this is that at night time, once they looked after all the hotel guests, they then went about their business and the stories that he came up with 700 kilometers behind enemy lines in Sudan is an amazing story because this man saved thousands and thousands of lives. And, you know, the, uh, the old maxim and it's a Jewish maxim, but it's a maxim in the Christian world as well. He who saves one life saves the world. As an example of that. And he was just, well, OK, this was the case. But, you know, it wasn't just me. He's the most humble individual with the greatest human achievement. And there are amazing stories in there. Like, for example, he had um, 
black Jews because uh, they were partners. They were also Mossad commanders. He couldn't do the work that they did because, of course, the black Jews could go into the Sudanese camps where a white skinned man could not do. So they had different jobs to do. And he tells an amazing story about how years on, one of the um, black Mossad commanders went back to Addis Ababa on business and unfortunately uh, died in the street. And he had a call late at night to say that we had to find the body. And there was a non-air conditioned morgue with a parade of bodies in there, one of which was his brother, he called him. And another member of the team went to get him and he was given a full military Mossad funeral, transported back to Israel from Ethiopia. Uh, and five former Mossad chief executives were at the funeral. And he said, I've never told that story before. And I couldn't edit this podcast, right? You know what? I mean, every single syllable was, I mean, heart-wrenching and emotional. And my podcasts, I try and make them 30 minutes, 40 minutes. You know, people have got a, a, a you know, a, an interest, you know, and then you know, they might switch off. But I couldn't, I, 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 people stick with it. And it's one hour and 18 minutes, and it's the longest one I've done, but I think you'll enjoy it. If Jerry allows me to have one hour and 18 minutes of a schedule, it's on. Right. <laughs> now, your broadcasting career is, shall we say, extensive, radio and television. Can we go back to the very, very, very beginning? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Birmingham. Um, and um, you're, a, you're from the northwest, aren't you, like Jerry? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I was born in Liverpool, but grew up in Great Sankey near Warrington is where I grew up. Right, yeah. right, right. But I spent some time in Birmingham. I worked at BRMB for about three years. Yeah. Do you know what? I remember your name there. And that might have been in the 80s and 90s. It was, it was a little bit late. It was the late 90s, actually. Yeah. OK. Yeah, because I remember the name. I wasn't there because I was doing all my uh, stewardship and sort of training in the uh, mid 80s as a, as a teenager. Um, and I was very, very lucky because I wanted to be a sports reporter. And in those days, local radio was king. And we had great football teams in the West Midlands. I know you have to go back 40 years for that to happen, but we did. We had Aston Villa, who would be... European champions, Aston Villa, yeah. Absolutely. And you'll know, being a, a Merseysider, that we interrupted Liverpool's greatness for two years. We won the league and then the European Cup in the middle of Liverpool's greatness. With a number of Liverpudlian players. Which is all the more ironic, Dennis Mortimer, Peter With, Kenny Swain. But Peter With was a dot worker and grew up under the nose of Liverpool and Everton and played for Southport, but then won the league with Forest and then won the league with Villa, interrupting Liverpool. He's one of those rich footballing ironies. And I had the privilege of interviewing Peter. What a great man he is. One of my favourite characters in football of all, including Pele and Maradona and Zidane. A great work ethic, a hero Peter With in in Villa history, absolutely adore the man. Um, so obviously BRMB and, and Beacon Radio was where I had my first full-time job in the West Midlands with Wolves and Albion and Villa. And Radio WM was where I cut my teeth and really learned all that kind of BBC kind of training. But of course, Villa and Albion were good teams. Birmingham have always been rubbish. Um, you, you won't hear me say much good about them. I'm sorry um, about that. You can edit that out later, but I don't care. I'm also the director of the Supporters Trust. I'll, I put that in, I've got to put that interest in the, the Aston Villa Supporters Trust. Um, but that's where I started. I cut my teeth there. And then um, after Beacon Radio, I went national. I came down to London and I've been here ever since. Uh, worked at the BBC World Service with some amazing characters. Because I was 23 in 1990, there were 70 year old broadcasters who were coming to the end of their careers. And I feel like I've held on to the baton from the kind of the very the very original people who spoke back there. And I swear, I replaced Paddy Feeney on Sports World. And Paddy Feeney is one of those chaps right from the start. What a nice man uh, Paddy was. And he handed over to me as though I was like his equal. And though I had the same job as him, he might have been, I don't know, 60s or 70s, and I was 23. I never felt like that. I felt I was walking in the shadow of these giants. And, um, you know, I'm really... Really, being a sports guy and being in the same room as these guys has been a real privilege. And, and LBC in the Australian 1990s, when they brought over their news talk, you know, that idea where they argue and it's a whole new thing, which is now prevalent in a lot of radio around the world. Um, so, of course, they brought in all those stars. They brought in Austin Mitchell, who 
of course, not only was the MP, but he interviewed Brian Clough and Don Reamy together. Uh, Vi it was an amazing, legendary interview. Uh, Viscount Ultrop, um, uh, Charles Spencer uh, was there as well. Angela Rippon, Edwina Curry, another another Liverpudlian Graham. Uh, maybe you don't want to. Maybe you don't want to admit that. I'm not sure. But Edwina. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but uh, it's been it's been a it's been an amazing amazing journey, and I've met amazing people. And Sky News, I became a friend of Eamon's, uh, Eamon Holmes over the years, and worked with Tanya Bryant. I mean, uh, the, the modern day um, uh, current broadcasters and legendary broadcasters of the past, all those guys called Mike at LBC, Mike Allen, and Mike Dickin, the late Mike Dickin, marvelous man. Mike Mike Allen unfortunately has passed away. I did five years with Robbie Vincent on LBC, who I think is the greatest phone show host of all time. He's doing a show on Jazz FM now with his massive record collection, but they should put him back on the radio as a uh, as a phone show host because that guy had a command of everything. Honestly, I learned so much from these guys. And being a sports guy in a news talk environment, you sit in the studio with them. It's just, you know, I, I just, I'm just so lucky. Um, and I uh, wouldn't mind having a proper daytime job as well now. I think I've got all the... Uh, I think I've got all that. Uh, I'd like to say I've got all that experience under my belt, but I've got some of it over my belt as well these days. <laughs> In 2010, you started to appear regularly on Al Jazeera. Now, that is a network that sometimes is perceived as, as having a, an Islamic perspective. And even though Al Jazeera insists it, it, uh, it covers all sides of, of the debate and it, it presents Israel's views regularly, did you have any opposition from the Jewish community or, or family and for Jewish friends about working for Al Jazeera? Not from open-minded um, Jewish people. Uh, in fact, <laughs> the producer who brought me in was uh, a, a Jewish woman and uh, she'd been there for many years, never experienced any anti-Semitism. And uh, honestly, let me tell you something, with the news in the last couple of weeks where the United Arab Emirates have made peace with Israel, it's the Al Jazeera organization, which is of that Gulf states environment looking out to become globalized partners yeah reinventing themselves and it was that environment look i'm not going to say that every single person uh, was on side with me and i was called a disgrace and all this kind of thing i don't care about that actually i wasn't talking about politics there i was talking mo mainly about set blatter and fifa that was my job for them i had to talk about fifa and uefa and the international politics of football and to be honest he was an easy target wasn't he except really so i talked a lot about him um and that was my major role and there were all sorts of uh, scandals that i was involved in there was the uh luis suarez biting of uh, the shoulder he did a lot of biting didn't the old suarez it seems to be coming around to the liverpool themes it's coming around to the liverpool themes all the time it's an accident but it's just it's it's good radio but Suarez was in my thoughts there. But listen, um, I had a great association with them. I wish them luck. And what's happening now is a vindication, I think, of uh, building bridges because the UAE has made peace. The first flight from Tel Aviv to Abu Dhabi happened uh, this week. Uh, and Oman and Bahrain will follow. Uh, and we are reaching a game-changing peace with the whole of the Arab region. And don't forget, Egypt and Jordan are already peace partners with Israel and the Egyptian Israeli deal, which is now 42 years old, survived a Muslim Brotherhood government. And I think that, you know, that significant uh, nugget of information tells you about kind of Israel being, being here to stay and, 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 and kind of being part of it and, and people needing each other. And I think that's uh, that's the kind of triumph of the last decade. People might not like Benjamin Netanyahu, but he wins election after election. And one of his major triumphs is reaching out to the world, and he's reaching out into Eastern Europe with Hungary, with uh, with, uh, with 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 Poland. Lesser, there's, there's been a tricky relationship there over the Holocaust, uh, but with Britain and Germany and Romania, um, you know, the, the world is changing. It's joining up in a post-Brexit way. Um, so, so watch this space, this space, because I think Jewish State will cover that too. What do you think of the current state of broadcasting in the UK? Are we in good shape? I mean, we just had a lot of radio consolidation, but overall, are we in good shape? For 24 years, I ran sports media and business media, which was a news agency providing bespoke bulletins to local radio stations all over the country. Um, and it 
survived because of the diversity of marketplace. So there was always a global radio station in the city, and there was a Bauer station, usually in the northwest and uh, northeast of, of, of the country. And then there was the local radio group and maybe three or five or 10 or even 15 radio stations. All of them, all of them were swallowed up this week, which meant that the uh, sports media business model became defunct. Actually, uh, I was very fortunate enough to do a deal with Global Radio uh, where we covered all the gold radio stations. So we had all the AM and DAB classic music radio stations in every city of the country and some of the FM um, radio stations too. But now that business model has gone. And I've got to say, probably like you, Graham, if we were starting out aged 18 again, we would never be able to repeat our journey into radio. We would have never been able to train. I've watched videos of broadcasters half my age saying, I've been on this Barnsley station now for 10 years. I want to thank uh, everyone. I'm a Barnsley man. I'm sorry that I won't be here on Saturday. It's greatest hits radio, etc. And I really feel sorry for them because local radio is needed. And I think it's vandalism. I do. And I'm, I'm not I'm not ashamed to say it. Um, there has been too much uh, over consolidation. Uh, and if we truly want to calibrate the economy around the country, we need to provide local radio, which can be regulated and funded on FM and DAB alongside of Greatest Hits and Smoother, which I was a part of, uh, etc. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not ashamed or afraid to say that. And when I'm on podcast radio, uh, working with you, with, with Gene Levine, with Paul Chandler and Jerry. Uh, it's partly because not only am I happy to be uh, brothers in arms with you guys uh, with, with a product to share, but also that you're the true entrepreneurs that I remember growing up together in radio as we did uh, in our 20s, 30s, 40s and beyond. Thanks for that, Johnny. We'll, go, we'll, uh, we'll change the world together. Yeah, now let's, let's talk about a scandal you weren't involved in. Uh, 2018, uh, the FT reports that you were the host of the President's Club charity dinner at the Dorchester Hotel. The event became infamous because there were allegations that female staff uh, were, were groped and treated inappropriately. You weren't even there. So take me through what happened and the effect it had. Graham, I've had Twitter pylons now a lot over a number of things. If I've said something on Sky News that people don't like, or I've said something in my role um, of the supporters trust in football that the Villa fans don't like, occasionally I get uh, a little bit of grief, but this was far and away the worst. And it happened near midnight because of course it was in the FT and it was in the morning paper. Uh, but of course the FT releases the paper at like 10 o'clock at night. And suddenly I got at tagged from nowhere scores and scores of times an hour. And my friend, uh, Jonathan Friedland of The Guardian, phoned me at midnight and said, listen, you need to sort this out. And I wondered what it was. And as you say, it was an article by Madison Marriage, which um, had... She was, she was an undercover journalist at the event, wasn't she? She was working as a, a waitress there, and she had accused assorted men of... I don't know, um, pinching a bum or making passes at her and that it was a sort of lad's night out with cigars. Um, and it was an expose, a very feminist expose, I must say, because there are other sides to the story. A lot of these guys are just sort of harmless away from their wives, talking about their kids, etc. going out on sort of business evenings. Maybe they don't want to be out, but they feel part of it and maybe they can network, etc. Um, but it was an expose and it was, I don't know, a few thousand words. But what was so damaging was the first seven words of it were open quotes. Welcome to the most un-PC event of the year, close quotes, said Jody Gould. Right. Which meant that anyone who drifted off having uh, read a part of it would have registered me. And there were thousands and thousands of retweets calling for my sacking at Sky News. And I thought, this is dangerous. They removed me from the schedule. You know, and it has to be said, it was Johnny Gould, but it was a different Johnny Gould. With the same spelling of the name. It, it was the celebrity auctioneer. 
And, um, you know, I hold no grudges against him. I think he was a bit sore from it, to be honest. But I'm pleased to say the guy who's raised, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions in charity has come back. And I phoned him up and he wasn't terribly happy with me, but it literally had nothing to do with me. The reason, the reason I took action was not against the auctioneer. I, I, I've got no bone to pick with him. Mine was the clumsiness of the reporting. If they'd have said Johnny Gould, the baseball presenter and celebrity auctioneer, I would have had to suck that up. Maybe people would have still mistaken me. But the FT libeled me, the Sun libeled me, Evolve Politics libeled me, and some other organization I can't remember. And I won tens of thousands of pounds worth of damage with another guest uh, of the series, the famous Mark Lewis, uh, the lawyer who's been behind all the, uh, the Labour Party allegations. In fact, it was uh, Mark who I introduced to John Ware, the panorama a documentary maker who's become a friend and was also a guest on my show over the um, uh, program is Labour Anti-Semitic, which was run um, a few months before the general election, uh, which again, he's won damages for as well. Uh, so um, yes, that was the President's Club. Um, it wasn't pleasant, but Mark Lewis handled it for me. Um, he took away some of the pain of it and I lived to fight another day and these things do you know, do blow over and um, it's all it's also part of life's experience. And what did you want from that? Did you want financial compensation or did you just want them to, I don't know, put a big retraction in or something? Um, as part of the deal, they had to put five apologies online every sort of 12 hours and they had to put a printed apology in the FT newspaper. The Sun did the same thing and paid me uh, a compensation. Actually, some of it I gave... Uh, to charity because of course it, it's it's kind of it's kind of free money it's not it's not earned money so it was it was uh, like I didn't feel like I should do it the most I tell you what the most important thing was to not get sacked by Sky News which was a job that I really really loved and and luckily Sarah Jane Me and um, Jonathan Samuels and a, another set of presenters you know put tweets out which were really you know really really humbling actually really nice that they should take the time and say it's not him he's a nice guy really and uh, don't sack him and that was the end of that and I was I was actually in on Thursday that week and luckily we didn't touch on the story I'm glad we didn't because I just want to get on with my my lot who had nothing to do with me ironically I was on a train the world's longest train journey at the time of this president's club malarkey coming back from my in-laws who live in Strasbourg now, there's no direct flight from the European capital to London. So I have to get on this train and go across French country and change at Paris with toddler children. Um, and luckily, the phone didn't work. Otherwise, I would have been having kittens on the train. So that's where I was. That's my alibi. I was nowhere near it. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the unfortunate thing is, though, if you Google your name with the word scandal next to it, the FT article still comes up. I don't know how you get that taken down. Yeah, they've rewritten it. And actually, if you look at it, it says something in italics at the bottom saying, uh, you know, being rewritten to make clear. Um, and, you know, I've got to say something else, which is occasionally, and you can't correct this all the time, Johnny Gould raise, raises hundreds of thousands of pounds for amazing charities. And occasionally, famous rugby and cricket stars follow me by accident. <laughs> now, I, I mean... You know, I'm not sure whether they follow me because Johnny's a, a charity hero or because they think I'm the world's greatest broadcaster. But, you know, sometimes uh, Johnny Gould works 48 hours a day, if you know what I mean. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's as if there's two of you. Uh, yeah. um, now, you're a journalist then and you've been through that experience. I mean, it's, you know, we've had the phone hacking, of course, and Leveson. What do you think of the standard of, of tabloid journalism in the UK? I think Rupert Murdoch did us all a favour by getting rid of the news of the world. Um, I think he understood that it was toxic. Um, I, won't, I, won't, I mean, the Sun had its issues through the years, obviously. I won't have a bad word said about him, really, honestly. I think, I think I'm quite a unique journalist in that way because, I mean, he brought, he's, he's a swashbuckler. Uh, Sir Alan Sugar, or Lord Sugar, I should say, said so on that profile of the murder. So a lot of journalists don't like him. But what he's brought to journalism overall, apart from the sort of scurrilous mm -hmm. stories, which are a bit unpleasant, um, is it is is a kind of new kind of football it might be over now uh, a different kind of football is required a different kind of monetization of football is required the business model has changed but he changed football forever and for the better i think 
um, over 25 years. I think it's become a little bit fat and lazy, and there's only five clubs who can win the Premier League now. But that's to do with the governance of the football and not to do with uh, Rupert Murdoch. He's made the right decisions. His instincts were right to get rid of the news of the world. Um, the sun has changed. Its power has changed because, of course, tabloids have changed. You know, the idea of being able to sort of, you know, turn the lights off if you're the last, uh, you know, Labour voter or whatever. Those days of actually picking the government may have changed for good. Social media is absolutely enormous. And, um, you know, it's affecting everything. The BBC stands on its own with hardly any reform at all, apart from uh, less money being given to it by the, by the government and via licence fee payers. Uh, but it will have to change because uh, terrestrial television, for want of a better description, which isn't an accurate description anymore, must change. There are so many good things about the BBC, but not all of it. And um, we need to be we, we need a network who's talking peace to its people. And there have been too many controversies uh, around the BBC where I'm afraid a peace is not being spoken to us. Right. What that it's got that left leaning bias that uh, yeah, it's accused I mean, of. It's bare naked, actually, in some. And, and the sadness is that the BBC is such a, a giant cultural force. So you have, you know, for those of us who've got young kids like me, CBBS. What a great channel! Okay, that is the BBC classic sort of programming of, of old, with great presenters and great morals, great ethics. You know that you can leave a kid in front of the television for hours with CBBS and know it's safe. You've got beautiful ideas like Friday night is music night, the the Philharmonic Orchestra, absolutely beautiful concepts, the Natural History Unit. But you try and watch. Uh, the news and current affairs output, it is, it's a disgrace. It's, it's appalling. The news channels are, not all of them, okay, because you can't, you, you, you can't sort of brush stroke everyone. But, um, you know, to be lectured and to be told what's what is bringing down the reputation of the sort of the, 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 um, the good-minded sort of uh, people of the BBC, which, which, is how, which is how I remember uh, my association with the BBC. I'm not afraid to say these things. What about the, say, the journalistic pillars of the BBC? I'm talking, say, Panorama and the Today Show. Are they still in good shape? Newsnight is a bit of a clique. Um, since Paxman left, it's, um, uh, it's, it's, it's not got the resources or the trust. I don't think it has the trust uh, with its audience anymore. I think Hugh Edwards is a very trustworthy chap, the way he sits there like that with a lovely haircut. Lost a bit of weight. I like Hugh, actually. He's a very, he's a, honestly, he is a great presenter. Uh, the Today programme has lost its way since Humphreys has gone. Well, I know people want to get rid of him, but they were left-leaning people who wanted to get rid of him. Um, and, and I think Tim Davey has a job. That Royal Britannia thing, what a disgrace. What an absolute disgrace. How dare they? It's the proms. Give it to ITV. If they're going to do that, give it to ITV. Yeah, yeah. Does, uh, you know, broadcasting in this country is quite commercial broadcast is quite heavily regulated uh, via Ofcom. Do, do you think that newspapers need to be regulated in the same way after your experience? I think the way that regulation of impartiality um, has been is almost obsolete. You know, we're seeing changes now, aren't we? We're seeing um, Sir Robbie Gibb being finally confirmed as out there as setting up a, a right of centre news organisation, because quite simply, um, it's required. Sky News has moved to the left since the uh, sale that Murdoch organised of, of, of Sky News. They've got to find a new business model to make it work with the Premier League's revenues probably sort of flatlining now, although it is at a massive, at a massive level. Um, 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 Impartiality is, 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 is problematic because in this world of schismatic ideologies, you know, if you're impartial to balance the views of terrorists, then that's not impartiality. Well, the BBC got caught out with the, uh, the MMR vaccine people, didn't it? And, uh, yeah. You, I mean, climate change is another one that you've got to be... Yeah, it's problematic. I've had I've had friends um, bullied by you know the ivory towers at uh, W1A 1AA for questioning it um, because actually you have to you can't have well we should question everything really it's, it's healthy debate yeah 
BBC policy is that we accept uh, that climate change exists, OK. But that doesn't mean to say that some of the people who deny it or whatever their position is are bonkers. You know, we can't say it exists. They are lumped in with the flat earthers, aren't they? <laughs> When, when all they need to do is question things now and again so that we are getting the right information so we can find the right solutions. And the BBC have made a, a terrible decision, this is going back to Jolly Gold's Jewish state, uh, to say that the policy is to accept a two-state solution. I mean, the UAE have done a peace deal with Israel based on the end of the Oslo Accords, the fact that the Oslo Accords didn't work, that it was an attempt to make peace, which is now over, it's finished. The two-state solution, as discussed in the Oslo Accords idea, is over. And that, 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 that deal between the Gulf states, and it won't just be UAE and Adelby, Oman and Bahrain, is part of a new idea where Donald Trump's deal of the century will force the Palestinians to the table, whereas the Oslo Accords, in simple terms, sued Israel for peace, tried to get Israel to go for peace. And as it turned out, Israel didn't have reliable peace partners. So as Mark Regev told me in one of the episodes, the former ambassador to the UK, where well, I interviewed him at uh, the Kensington Israeli em um, embassy, he said um, the Palestinian rejectionism must come to an end and Israel must not be held back in its development by the no, no, a thousand times no. So when the BBC talk, about uh, the two-state solution, uh, you know, being a, the accepted uh, policy that we should follow, and then we take all our broadcasting from there. I'm afraid uh, that's a, 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 a cause for great bias and not the impartiality that they think they should be presenting to the audience. Is is impartiality even possible? Because everybody has a, an opinion. Everybody is. Is, is it maybe time to just say, OK, we're not impartial, this is where we stand, and just be open about the, the lack of impartiality and at least to be honest? You know what? At Sports Media, we localised bulletins so that we deliberately veered them to the area in which we broadcast. So, for example, if it was Oxford United against York City, we'd be cheering on Oxford United on Fox FM and we'd be doing quite the opposite on Minster. You know what I mean? Because that's local radio. And of course, in those days, when you were dealing with independent stations, competing as they were with the same music as Radio 1 and Radio 2, they wanted us to be distinct. So as you say, impartiality is, is a difficult thing. You know, you have to set editorial parameters. But that, notwithstanding that, you do, Graham, I think we both agree on this, you have to permanently ask questions. Because as a species, if we don't ask questions, we're never going to advance. Yeah, yeah. Well, you ask plenty of great questions in the podcast. Johnny, see what I did there? Johnny Gould's Jewish State. It's out now. You can hear it on podcast radio. Don't miss it. It's available on all the usual podcast platforms, your, uh, Apple Podcasts and Stitcher and TuneIn and everywhere else. Yeah, Spotify, all those. Good stuff. Johnny Gould, thank you very, very much for your time. Graham, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.